Well, it's sure good to be here. I will tell you, my wife and I arrived last Tuesday, or Wednesday night, and we've been settling down and getting things going, and it's really been quite an experience. Uh, as you know, that one of the things that I do, for those who don't know, I have been in the ministry for over 50 years. My wife and I have been married 50 years, and uh, I've been in, I started out as a youth pastor for eight years, and then after that, I went into church planting, and then after that, I went as senior pastor for several years for different churches. That, but then I came down to a point when I got a little bit older and my, I was in my starting in my 60s, I decided, you know, we should let the younger guys preach. But at the same time, I also wanted to help churches be able to, you know, uh, do that transition between being without a pastor and getting a pastor. And so a friend of mine, I told him that, and I told him I was retiring on April 30th. And uh, of that year that I retired, and he said, well, he says, I've got a church for you to go to right now, and, and he says, I want you to go, and he says, you can be there by May 1st, right? And I said, no. And uh, I said, I'll be there May 30th, and that's exactly what happened. I was there over the weekend, and that's when I started. I was there. I went to that church, and uh, I will tell you, they had all kinds of problems, and uh, problems that you don't want to hear about, and I cannot tell you about, but they were very, very major. And I will tell you, God blessed us. Uh, we saw a miracle after miracle happen. Uh, I was there four and a half years, and the reason was because of the nature of the problems. Now, I don't plan on staying here that long. I plan on staying here. I mean, in all seriousness, what happened in that problem, they were major problems. But in the next church, I also let it be known, okay, it's time for me to leave, and you get a new pastor, and they did. And so I went to Yakima, Washington. And as I was in Yakima, Washington, I went to the Bible church there, and the problem with that church was is that about three months before I arrived, they had gone from 635 in one week down to 335 because of a church split. And uh, it was a, a major thing. But I will tell you this, that we were there for 17 months, and we saw the church go back up to 635. Today, that church is over 900. And all, all I'm saying, and then there's a couple other churches. I went to the one in Yucaipa, and I was there for about a year and a half. And then I finished up in, or then also went to a church in Kingman, Arizona. So I've been around, and I, this is my fifth church that I have been working with. With I usually work with an organization called IPM, Interim Pastoral Ministries. But I, I was asked specifically by your denomination, more particularly by the, the Northwest American Baptist, to come and, and to meet with your, the church here, and I'm here to do that. I am looking forward to being here with you. I, I tell you what, I, I want you to understand something. I expect God to do great things here. I really do. And I expect God to call a man for you as a pastor that's going to lead you in following Christ in reaching Twin Rivers for Jesus Christ. I firmly believe that. And uh, Twin Falls. Did I say Twin Rivers? That was the first church I was in. I tell you what. You know, let's see. I'm in Twin Falls. Is that right? I'm not in Eugene. I'm, okay, I'm not in Springfield. Okay. Get used to it. <laughs> I can make more mistakes than anybody else in preaching, but I'll tell you what, I'll keep you on your toes and keep you laughing. But anyway, let's uh, pray and ask God to really open our ears this morning. Father God, we pray in the name of Jesus, by the power of your Holy Spirit, Father God, that you anoint me, and I pray that you will open the ears of the people and that we will listen to your word this morning. And I pray, Father God, as we open up the Word of God, that we will see what we need to apply to our lives. For this I pray in Christ's name, amen. Now, I realize there are a lot of older people here, and quite frankly, I is one. And, uh, but I would like to ask you, are there any people here that were alive during world, uh, the beginning of World War II? Okay, there are a few hands here. Can you remember... What happened on that day when you heard that Pearl Harbor was bombed? Can any of you remember? Okay, think about that. It was a great event, wasn't it? A bad event, but a great event, a big event. And a lot of times we'll have events in our life when something will come into our lives and it will cause us to step back a little bit and begin to reflect and begin to look at the situation and begin to yell out, God, I need your help. Can anybody tell me where they were on November the 22nd, 
1963, what happened? John F. Kennedy, what were you doing, any of you? Yeah, remember? You know what I was doing that day? I was out for drama in my high school. I was a senior in high school, and I was backstage, and it hadn't been announced to the school. And we were, by the way, it was during the middle of the day because we were basically doing a, you know, a kind of a, a pre, you know, one of those things that you want to get the students to come to. And it was the Diary of Anne Frank, and I, we were just doing just a small part of the play. And I remember backstage, I heard, they said, oh, have you heard the radio? John F. Kennedy's been shot. And during that day, what happened, it was so interesting at the high school. The high school I was going to was about 1,300, and the kids didn't go to class. They started walking around. They were all staring at each other, and they said, what do we do now? Some of the people said, let's go, let's go join the service and go fight. What's happened? Pre President Kennedy's been shot. Can anybody tell me what happened on September the 1st and where you were in the year 2001? 11. What did I say? September 1st. You know, I'm getting old. I can, you know, September 11. Tell me. What happened? Twin River, I mean, Twin Twat Towers, not Twin Rivers, but Twin Towers got bombed, right? Now. And I want you to understand this. It was a major event. I was at a coffee shop that morning at 7 30. Walked in, I was getting a mocha, and I was with a friend of mine, the chairman of the elder board at the church I was pastoring at the time, and we looked and we saw one of the towers burning with a plane inside of it. I want to tell you something amazing, and we all said, what's happening to us? What's happening to us? Amazing, isn't it? There are all kinds of events that will happen in our life, and we begin to ask What's going on in our life? What's going, what, what am I going to do? Well, today I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 6, and I'd like to read the passage to you. And we're going to look at uh, just a few verses here. It's Isaiah, his king has died. It's a major event that has come into his life. He is a prophet. But it is an event that God used in Isaiah's life that changed his life forever and changed Judah's and Israel's life forever. For God had come to him and spoke to him very directly. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, and two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, Holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the doors were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said to him, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having his hand a live coal, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, Hanani, in Hebrew, which means, Here am I, send me. And he said, go and tell the people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make their heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and with understand with their heart and return and be healed. Then I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitant, the houses are without man, and the land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of land, but yet a tenth will be in it and will return and be for consuming. As a terebinth tree, as an oak whose stump remains when it is cut down, so the holy seed shall be its stump. As we work through this, one of the things that we have to see is Isaiah's vision, his vision of God. And it happens because of a tragedy. When King Uzziah died. Now, that's rather interesting. We look at King Uzziah, and he was a very, very powerful, powerful king at the time of Judah. 
He was one that, by the way, his father was a terrible king. He was one that burnt incense to idols. He was one that was just so corrupt. And, but Uzziah, when he became king, he basically said, I am going to live for God. And what he did, he gave his life to God, and he constructed cities, towns, and wells. He raised cattle. He had plantations. He developed a powerful army, and God blessed him, and the people of Judah began to prosper again. Great things were happening in Judah. Why? Because this godly king was following the Lord. But he reigned there for 50 years, but toward the end of his career, he began to read his press clippings. You know, so often what happens to us as Christians, we get saved and, and God works in our life. And, and for us, we begin to forget about God. And so what happened? Uzziah began to be proud. And one of the things he did, he angered God because he did something that the priests were only supposed to do. And that he burnt incense in the temple. And as a result of that, he had leprosy and he was taken. Oh, he still was the king, but they had to put him off a little bit where people couldn't go around him because that disease spread. And, and so eventually he died. Isaiah was a prophet, or it was the prophet at the time. He was a man that was communicating with the Lord all the time, and at the same time, he communicated with Uzziah, and he, commu he communicated with the people. He walked with God. He talked with God. But now he's going to get a vision of God. In one sense of the word, he is confronted by God himself. He's confronted with this vision. I think there are times in our Christian life when we get saved, when we come and invite Jesus in our heart, we're so excited about the things of God. Oh, God, I, I just, oh, I, I can't wait to get to church. Oh, Lord, I can't wait until I read scripture. Oh, to sing those songs. Oh, it's fantastic. And to be around other Christian people. But after a few years, we, well, the problem is that sometimes you end up in Bedside Baptist or the Church of the Inner Spring. You don't make it to church to worship. And you forget about God. Then along comes a slap in the face or a tragedy. And you're like the disciples that were in the boat and, and the storm came and, and finally they wake Jesus up and they say, Jesus, don't you know there's a storm? Yeah. Yes, I do. What's the problem? I'm in the boat. And so he says, Jesus gets up and he calms the storm. You see, that's what happens to us. So often, God sends tragedies or major events in our life to wake us up. Look at this. In the year King Uzziah died politically, it was a period of transition. Assyria, Syria were become, gaining strength, and they were going to become arch enemies of Israel. Spiritually, the people began to get an idolatry. And they began to turn their hearts away from God. And economically, it was a period of a blessing. A oh, great blessing. The people were walking with God, but now they were beginning to stray. You know, I read these things, and I, and I, by the way, the leadership was great, and, and yet they begin to read their press clippings also. Boy, doesn't that sound like the United States? Do you realize we're in the most powerful country in the world? And yet... Our government today, now, I'm not getting political, and even if I am, don't worry about it. I'm meddling. And I meddle a lot. I'll just let you know. We kicked God out of the schools in 1960s, didn't we? There has been movements to basically cut our freedom of speech out so that we can't talk about God. And if you do, you'll get fired on your jobs. We're the wealthiest country in the world. But we forgot God. And a good example of it is what that Virginia governor did last week. That's our leadership. Now, don't get me wrong. There's not, not much we can do except that we know Almighty God. And we can pray. And God's still on the throne. And God was aware that King Uzziah died. And we need to recognize that we have a greater God than any government in the world. 
And whether the government follows God or not follows God, we do follow God, and God takes care of his own. But I would say this, is that when we as Christians begin to allow our view of God to decrease what happens, our problems increase. When parents no longer want to be parents, when people in their marriages no, want to, no longer want to be married, when kids are disobedient to their, their parents, Romans 1 talks about this. There's a problem, isn't it? And I think what is happening with, you, uh, with Isaiah, he is seeing all these things that here, as a prophet, he, you know, he, he did his job, but he sees the country going downhill. And now what are we going to do that Uzziah has died? And he goes to the temple and he begins to pray. You know, think about it. You guys have gone through three pastors in the last three years. You've been hurt. You really have, haven't you? Been left alone a little bit, haven't you? But God's still on the throne. And you need to recognize how big God is. And God has a purpose for this church. You see, God established this church. Jesus is the head of this church. And you are here to be his witnesses in Twin Falls. I got it right. Praise God. And I'll tell you what. What, but I want you to understand that we need to recognize that God's still on the throne, and no matter what the problems we will face, we need to get a glimpse of God this morning. And so he began to pray, and as he began to pray, he began to see the Lord, and he saw these bad things happening, and this vision came to him. And he saw the throne of God, high and lifted up. And he saw... God sitting on the throne. In other words, he saw a theophany. He saw Jesus sitting there. Amazing, isn't it? God's in charge. You know, why is it we Christians get so upset with what's going on in society? You know, are sinful. If they don't know Jesus, they're going to do these things. Why don't we realize that we've got the message of hope? We've got the message to tell them that life can be eternal if they only come to Christ. Then what happened to Isaiah? He saw an angels, seraphim. Who are the who are the seraphim? There are two types of angels, cherubims and seraphim. Seraphims, they're a different breed. Basically, they're responsible. By the way, they're only mentioned twice in Scripture. But their purpose is basically they lead in worship. They are basically, as, as you look at them, if you look at their faces, they're of fire. And that fire represents purity. And they are to have pure worship. And here's Isaiah observing this, and he sees them flying over that. And then they cry out something that's very important. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. What does that mean? What does holiness mean? Most of the time, you'll hear preachers preach and say, well, the word basically means righteousness. No, it does not necessarily mean righteousness. It's not that at all. The word means actually uh, sanctification. It means that man has, or that God has set apart. He is above his creation. He is transcendent, yet he is involved in his creation. Another word for holy, holy, holy is good. And if you go back into the New Testament, you remember when the people said, uh, when Jesus was asking them different questions, and this one person says, you are good. And he answered him and says, I am good. Only God is good. The word good in Scripture basically is talking about purity. It's talking about no sin at all, total perfection. And people, we need to begin to realize how big is your God? And we need to realize that God is holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And if there's anything that we have forgotten, is that we have forgotten who God is. Oh, God, he's my good buddy upstairs. <laughs> really? Let me ask you this. You as a kid, did you grow up, especially you older people, would you, if you ever said to your dad, oh, that's my old man. Oh, he's, he's, he's my daddy. You know, he's, he's, he's not much. What would have happened to you? Now, I don't know about you, but I know what my dad would have done. 
I'd pick myself up off the ground and I'd say, sir, what do you want me to do? If there's anything that's happened is we have lost respect for God. And we've allowed other people to downgrade God. Oh, I don't want to say anything. I'm afraid they're going to hurt me. They're not going to hurt you. We need to stand up. A few years ago, you remember, people were going around. Oh, you go into these stores and you can't say Merry Christmas. You remember? These, all the people that are working, oh, you can't say Merry Christmas. And so they could say Happy Holidays. You know, I'd go into the store purposely. and say, well, Merry Christmas to you, especially at the check stand. Well, we, we can't say that. I said, oh, yeah, you can. And, but I said, well, anyway, Merry Christmas. And then they come back with some happy holidays. Well, you know what that means, don't you? It means happy holy days. You're not getting away from it. See, the people, we need to understand we serve a great God. Why are we afraid of the non-Christian? They're afraid of us. Believe it. But here's what happens to Isaiah. He begins to get a vision of himself because he realizes as a prophet, he's coming to a time in his life right now that he is beginning to see himself more clear. Aren't there times in your life that you're growing spiritually? Then finally, something comes along and slaps you in the face or something that sets you down and you reevaluate who you are spiritually. You ever do that? You ever... Have that happen and you fall to your knees and say, God, I need your help. I'm out of sorts. Well, this is what happened to Isaiah. He says, woe is me, I am ruined. I am a sinner before God. Isn't it interesting today that in the church we're afraid to say the word sin? We're afraid we're going to offend people. We go out in society. If people are offended, you can't crack jokes anymore. If people are offended... Well, I'm offended when people call themselves atheists, and I'm sick and tired of them offending me, aren't you? Now, I tell you what, as you know, I'm, I'm pretty blunt about some things, so I'm just going to be blunt. I'm just meddling. But he says, I'm a sinner. Listen to what Oswald Chambers says. A person will easily say, oh, yes, I know I'm a sinner, but when he comes into the presence of God, he cannot get away with such a broad and indefinite statement. Do you realize that when Jesus came to this earth, because we were separated from him because of sin. We were evil. Yet in God's great love for us, he gives his son Jesus to die on the cross for us. And for here's his prophet, this old prophet, who was the prophet to the most powerful guy in the region, Uzziah, and he dies. And now he's faced with God and he's saying, wow. I've strayed. I'm a sinner before God. In Isaiah 66, 1 and 2, it says this, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? Where is the place of rest? For all these things my hands have made and all these things exist, says the Lord. But on this one thing I will look upon, he who is poor and contrite of heart. What are you saying? You need to be broken before God. And we are broken. And God puts us back together. And when we come to Christ, we are no longer unforgiven, but forgiven. For I have unclean lips. I can't even speak the words. Here I'm a prophet and I'm supposed to speak. And I live among a people of unclean lips. I just spoke to one of the people this morning. And they were telling me that their son was a pastor up in, had been a pastor in, in Washington. And he said, you know, Things are going pretty bad up there with the drugs and everything else. And, and his, his son uh, just said, it's just unbelievable what people are doing today. You know, have you ever thought about it? We always think of uh, in the Bible about Lot, you know, and he, he was perplexed when he was in Sodom and Gomorrah. Not only perplexed, he really was grieved over what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. Are we grieved over the sin that's going on in the world today? I don't think so. I think a lot of people, even Christians today, live together before they're married. We as Christians today do things that we shouldn't do, watch things that we shouldn't watch. We need to understand we are people of unclean lips. And by the way, I will tell you, I don't know if you know this, but across the country I am in contact with a lot of denominational leaders 
people that are good friends of mine. And I will tell you, the church is in trouble. We've got men who occupy the pulpit that are afraid to preach the word of God. They're afraid to preach the word of God. And we've got people who are afraid to hear the word of God anymore. Don't you know that what Isaiah is coming to grips with is he says, I am unclean. And then finally the angel flew and brought tongues and he touched his lips. And then he says, your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Oh, people, God provided cleansing for him. God provided forgiveness. Isn't that what Jesus did? This morning, we're going to have communion, and we're going to break the bread. Jesus' body was broken for us. We're going to partake of the cup, and that cup represents his blood that was shed. Listen, I am a forgiven sinner. I am saved by his grace. I am now called his child. I am totally redeemed. And for those who are in Christ, there is no condemnation. Oh, Isaiah got a glimpse of God. And I tell you what, we need a glimpse of God like we've never had before. We need to recognize how great he is. Christ did it all for us. And he cleansed Isaiah the prophet. Then God says to Isaiah, he says, Isaiah, he says, I want you to recognize something. He says, I have a people that are not listening. I have a people that are, their hearts are far from me. I need to send somebody to tell them and to let them know that judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. And I'm going to scatter them. And 90% of them are going to be gone. Only 10% will return. I need a servant that's be able to go. And then finally, what happens? He looks and I says, says, Hanene, here am I. Send me. Wow. This prophet who had been cleansed and he recognized, he saw how great God is. He says, God, I'm willing to go where you lead me. I'm willing to do what you want me to do. And I'm willing to speak what you want me to do. And if it costs me my life, I will do it. Do you know what happened to him? He was sawed in two at the end of his career. That's how they killed him. But he did the will of God. That's gruesome, isn't it? But do you realize that God has called you and me to be his voice in a world that's gone mad? He's called us to say, share Jesus. Do you realize that we are in the day of harvest? Look under the fields, they are white under harvest. What it means is that there are people out there in Twin Falls that do not know Jesus, and we have the message of hope. Do you realize when we gather together, we are to worship together, we are to build one another up, but when we all leave these four walls, we are to go out and penetrate into the community and tell people about Jesus, become their friends, have them over for dinner, share Christ with them, let them know there is hope. And that was the message that God was giving to Isaiah. It's a little different. God says, whom shall I send? Isaiah says, here am I, send me. Are you willing to say that this morning? Are you? Are you willing to go and tell people about Jesus? We need to, don't we? We live in an interesting world, don't we? You know, some people say, well, I'd rather live my Christian life. I live my Christian life, people get saved. Now, what would happen if Jesus came into the world and he never told people that he was the Messiah? And he went around healing people, but he never told them why he was healing. He walked on water, but he never told why. He never told his disciples anything other than he's doing these miracles. And and then finally, he goes to the cross and he dies on the cross and even rises from the dead, but he doesn't tell anybody why. Would we know about Jesus today? No. You see, being a Christian is like having two wings. One is to live the life. The other is to tell about the life that you are living and communicate who Jesus Christ is. 
This church wasn't established just to hold meetings. This church was established to reach people for Jesus. And then when they're saved, we see them grow in Christ and teach them how to reach more people for Christ. This church was established to build strong families. This church was established to believe in a big God. I challenge you this morning, how big is your God? How big is your God? Is he big enough to take care of any problem? Is he big enough to uh, let you be witnesses to people that don't want to hear the message? Do you realize when you accepted Christ in your personal life, you became child of the king? You're saved by grace. Every one of us, we didn't earn it. He gives it. And there are times in my life I need to be reminded of that. There are times in my life I need to get a fresh vision of God. How big is your God this morning? My God gave his son, Jesus. His body was broken. My God sent his son, Jesus, and the blood was shed. I know your church practices communion once a month. You know the reason for that is to remember what Jesus has done. In Corinthians, it says, let a man examine himself. Let a woman examine themselves. Examine yourself. We come today and we will partake. But before we do, we need to examine ourselves. And we need to ask ourselves, am I bitter against somebody in the body? Am I bitter against somebody outside the church? Lord, forgive me before I take communion. Lord, have I, have I left you? Lord, is the Holy Spirit resident, in, I mean, is president in my life and just instead of a resident? When you partake of communion, you must go back and remember the day that you received Jesus Christ. For communion is for believers. You don't have to be a member of this church to partake of communion. But you need to know Jesus. If you don't know Jesus and you partake of communion, you don't understand the message. See, the message is that Jesus died for our sin. He was buried and rose again. And when we trust in him, we're not only saved, but adopted into the family of God. Isaiah had to be reminded of that. He had to be reminded of his message. He had to be reminded of who God is. And we need, on a regular occasion, evaluate who we are in Christ. So we're going to have, first of all, a private prayer where you just pray to the Lord. We'll all bow our heads just for about 30 seconds to a minute. And you just say, Lord, examine me right now. And the Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's time to have a meeting with Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we, we know that you have forgiven us. We know that you have given us eternal life. We know there's no condemnation for those who are in you. But sometimes, Lord, we get sidetracked. As we partake of the bread this morning, Lord, may we realize it was your body that was broken for us. Broken for me. So, Father God, as we partake, may we Take recognizing who you are. For this I pray in Christ's name. Amen.